Good morning. Welcome to worship. So glad to have you with today. Will you please rise in body or in spirit to well join us in? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. To those of you that are joining us on live stream, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. To those of you in person, thank you for being here. We do ask in this time that you do keep your masks on the whole time uh, that we are in worship. We will be continuing to sing, so don't worry about that. Um, and we welcome you to join us in fully and completely. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. Let's pray. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit to receive the good news. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, we are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, who is the bread of life, we are shown God's abundant mercy. We are forgiven. Live now into that abundant life. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Will you please join with me in singing our first hymn, number 542.
Please be seated. Gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Give us this bread always that he may live in us and we in him, and that strengthened by this food, we may live as his body in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading this morning is from 2 Samuel. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Etai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Then 10 young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, good tidings for my Lord the King, for the Lord has vindicated you this day delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. And the king said to the Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The word of God, word of life. Our second reading is from the Psalms, Psalm number 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Word of God, word of life. Amen. 
be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the religious leaders began to complain about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Invite the congregation to be seated. So we have five weeks with this same saying of Jesus, which means that there's something very important to be said. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. This is sourdough. This is my favorite kind. I'm sure that this is what Jesus meant. Sourdough. Fresh baked, warm, sliced, a little bit of butter on it. That's what Jesus meant, right? There are some other people. No, not pumpernickel. Absolutely not. Or rye. Not that either. Just sourdough. Thank you very much. But did Jesus really mean that he is a loaf of bread? No. Jesus meant that he feeds people. But you know, there is a problem with that. Because where I grew up, this was the kind of bread that a lot of people ate. It's a tortilla. Anybody else like tortillas? especially with all the good stuff filling inside of them, right? Could Jesus have said, I am the tortilla of life? I think the Hispanic population of the world would probably think that sounds just about right. I moved to another place. They didn't eat bread at all because their house don't have any sort of ovens. They have rice cookers. What's this? Did Jesus, could Jesus say, I am the rice of life? Possibly. Everyone who is, lives in Asia would definitely understand that Jesus is the rice of life. And then there's one more. Now this is one that's kind of new that I haven't had personal experience going to India to eat. Naan. Anybody here ever had naan? Oh, it's good. It's baked in a special oven and you have to cook has to put his or her hand down into the oven and it attaches to the wall of the oven and that's how it bakes. I am the naan of life. Yes? Could be. You know, 
there are lots of kinds of bread and staples in the world. And different people would hear this passage differently. If somebody was gluten-free, to say that Jesus is the bread of life means that Jesus is going to make you sick. Is that what Jesus meant? No. Jesus also didn't mean to cut out people that maybe everybody who doesn't like sourdough, they can't come. He didn't mean that. Jesus said, I'm the one who feeds the world. I am enough for everybody. And when we come here to this communion table and we have our wafers and when we have our gluten-free wafers, Jesus is here feeding us. That's the good news for today. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you that you give us bread and tortilla, rice and naan, and all of the different things that feed our bodies and our souls. May all people be fed by you, because with you it is possible. We give you thanks. Amen. So the first scripture reading, in case you were wondering about from 2 Samuel, continues the story of King David. Absalom was his son. They were at war with each other. And these were two competing armies looking to best each other. And Absalom died. And even though they were at war, they were still family. So it makes our family conflicts look not quite so bad. But some here in this congregation know what it means to lose a child and that kind of grief. Today we're going to continue with John chapter 6. This is week 3 of 5 weeks with the I am the bread of life passage. There is something that we need to hear. So let's dive into it after we pray. Gracious and almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock, you are our redeemer, and you are the one that feeds us body and soul. And for that, we give you thanks. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I really want that to be true. But time and time again in the biblical saga, we see hungry people. Genesis chapter 12. Abram and Sarai were living in the Negev desert, and there was a famine. So they moved into Egypt in search of food. Things didn't go quite so well for Sarai there, but that was due to Abraham, Abram's plots and his schemes but they had enough food in Egypt. Genesis chapter 46, Jacob's extensive family was living in Canaan and starving as a result of a large-scale famine. By a circuitous route and an interesting story, Joseph, one of the youngest sons, was in charge of all the food supply for the entire kingdom of Egypt. And knowing that his brothers were starving, Joseph invited his father and then entire clan to move to Egypt where they would have food security. And because of Joseph's actions, the entire family was saved. And because Pharaoh was generous when Joseph asked. Exodus chapter 16, the Hebrew people had just survived the flight out of Egypt, crossing through the Red Sea, and they looked out at the freedom and the wild, of the wilderness, and they saw nothing. There was absolutely no possibility of food, just sand dune after sand dune after sand dune. And so the Hebrew people cried out to Moses, and they complained against God. And what did God do? sent them bread raining down from heaven every morning. 
and birds flying into the camp and settling right there for them to capture every night so that they would have meat. And God did that every day for 40 years that they were wandering in the wilderness. The book of Ruth. There was a famine in the land of Judah, so Elimelech and Naomi took their family into Moab. And there, Naomi lost everything. She lost her husband, she lost her sons, she lost her hope. She and one daughter-in-law, Ruth, moved back to Judah. Things were still difficult for them, and they had to rely on the gleaning from the edges of the fields for their food and the generosity of Boaz. First King, chapter 17. Prophet Elijah was directed by God to go to Zarephath, where there was a famine. When he arrived, he noticed that there was a woman gathering sticks. And he asked her to bring him water, to bring him a cake that she would make for him. What he didn't know was that she had only enough food for a last meal for her and her son. She was gathering those sticks to cook that last meal that they would eat and then die. Elijah directed her, and from that moment, her jar of oil and her jug of flour never ran out until the drought and the famine had both ended. Mark chapter 6. A large crowd was following Jesus around, not wanting to miss anything that he said or did. The people never took breaks because Jesus never took a break, and they were getting hungry. With a few loaves of bread and with two fish and a blessing, Jesus fed 5,000 men and an unaccounted number of women and children, and then did it again two chapters later in Mark 8. Luke 6, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I really want that to be true. But time after time in human history, we have seen hungry people. My first exposure to famine was in the early 1980s. I don't know if you remember this. The Feed the World campaign, which culminated in that very repetitive Band-Aid song, Do They Know It's Christmas Time at All. Sorry, it's going to be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. This campaign, which gripped our nation's attention, was in response to a catastrophic Ethiopian famine. But famine isn't new. It was only my awareness of it that was. There have been numerous famines across time, from the biblical ones that I've already mentioned to modern times. In fact, from what I could read, there have been famines on every continent except Antarctica and Australia. The Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, the Indian subcontinent. Some of those famines were caused by drought or natural disaster. Some was caused by mismanagement of resources but all of them resulted in not enough food for too many people. There are people in our own congregation who know what food insecurity feels like. In the throes of World War II and its aftermath, when whole nations were defeated and desperate, some of our members lived in those places where malnutrition and the fear of not having enough stayed in their bodies and their minds for the rest of their lives, even when they got here to the land of plenty. Famines cause hundreds or thousands or millions of people to die prematurely. Social structures collapse when a large percentage of the population dies. Grief overwhelms the survivors who do not feel lucky. And from our distance, we experience the heartbreaking reality of other human beings suffering hunger pains. Did you know that currently in our world there are two ongoing famines? Did you know this? One is in Yemen and has been going on since 2016 the result of a civil war followed by a horrifically effective blockade. 
The other famine is so big it covers three countries, South Sudan, Somalia, and Nigeria. And that one has been going on since 2017 because of severe drought. This is not a short-term thing, and the food trucks and the water trucks come in. That's years of hunger. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Dear Lord, we want that to be true. We want Jesus to come and be the bread that sustains people's lives. We want crops to grow. We want people to have enough to eat. We want, above all, children to go to bed knowing what a full stomach feels like. We want politicians to govern by policies that guarantee food security for all people. We want economists and farmers to work together to get healthy, nutritious, life-giving food to people, especially those who need it the most. To be honest, we want more than our daily bread. We also want our spiritual hungers to be met. We want our hunger for justice and our thirst for righteousness to be quenched and satisfied. We want to break bread together around the Lord's table, full of the sure and certain hope that there is enough for all. We want generations to gather together and find that the whole family of God can be full and satisfied. When we commune together, we are gathering as God's people, diverse, beautiful, and beloved. And here, in spite of our differences, we find community. Here at the Lord's table, the needs of our bodies and our souls are met. Here is where we practice for the divine, eternal banquet in heaven. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are remembering the stories of when God fed the people time and time again. Here, when we share the bread of fellowship, we acknowledge also that there are still hungry people among us. And this is where we find the inspiration to feed them. In Jesus, our hungers and thirsts for God are satisfied. In Christ, we are content. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It is true. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to rise in body or spirit and join me in the next hymn, number 485.
Let us together affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn now to a time of prayer, it is with great sorrow that I announce to you that Pat Carden has died in the state of Colorado. And so we are praying for her family who are here in Massachusetts and across the country. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church the world, and all of creation. In addition to our prayer list are the grieving family and friends of Pat Carden. For the Church of Christ in all its diverse forms, for mission developers, new mission starts, and all communities of faith exploring new models of ministry for the sake of the gospel, for congregations facing difficult decisions about their future. Lord, in your mercy. For the health and well being of creation, for shade trees that provide refuge from the hot summer sun, for lakes, rivers, and oceans contaminated by pollution and all who lack clean water. Lord, in your mercy. For those called to positions of authority in our legal system, we pray. For judges, lawyers, law clerks, and court employees who ensure the fair administration of justice. For corrections officers and prison chaplains that they would deal mercifully with those who are incarcerated. Lord, in your mercy. For all who cry out to you in their affliction, for exiles, refugees, and others who face long and difficult journeys, uncertain about their future, and for all who mourn the death of a loved one, for all who are sick, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this assembly gathered around your table, we pray. For those among us who bake bread and prepare the vessels for our communion celebration. For those who bring food from this table to those who are homebound or hospitalized. Lord, in your mercy. For those who have been raised to eternal life, we give thanks. With all the saints, we praise you for the bread of life that keeps us in your love forever. Lord, in your mercy. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you always. I invite you to pass the peace with each other. Peace be with you. <laughs>
Our bodies have to remember standing up and sitting down. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we do communion a little differently. If you've not been here as we've done this, we will start by serving the organ side of the sanctuary first, coming up the center aisle and back by the side aisle. After this side has received and gone back to their seats, then we'll take this pulpit side of the congregation. Same thing, center aisle and back up by the side aisle. We will all commune together at the same time when we are back in our seats. If you need gluten-free wafers, please let me know. That is available up here. Jesus doesn't want to make anyone sick. Brothers and sisters, Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
the body and blood of Christ our Lord given for you. Once you have received, I invite you to rise in body or spirit. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It's wonderful to worship together. And I see some people here who haven't been with us for a while or ever. Uh, our tradition is we like to know who's here. And so if you don't mind standing up and telling us your name and from where you have come to be with us today, we would invite you. Yes, Peter. D'Artagna from Newport News. We are so glad that you're here. Welcome back to St. Peter's. I don't know if you've worshiped with us inside. We were always outside last year. Yes, you have. You've done that remotely all the way from Virginia, so we're glad to have you here. It's wonderful. This is what the inside of the church looks like in real life. Lovely, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> others who are visiting today. MJ. Beth, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us from Concord. I would like to introduce to you Jim Delamort, who is our musician for the day. And <laughs> it is not enough to come into a church you don't know, but then to be on some liturgy that's unfamiliar. Thank you for that. Jim is heading off in a couple of weeks. We asked him if he would like to continue playing for us a little bit here and there as we search for a new minister of music. He's going to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in two weeks. So he'll be a little busy studying aeronautics, but we're really grateful that you're here. Thanks for joining us today. There are a number of announcements in your yellow insert, several that I would like to call to your attention. Altar flowers are here every Sunday. If you'd like to donate them in honor or memory of someone, you are more than welcome to do that. The sheet is on our website. It's also um, on the door to the sacristy in the hallway if you'd like to pick that up. Um, if somebody knows somebody who would like to, they would like to give these flowers to today, please see me at the back door of church on your way out and we'll talk about that. Um, home communion ministry, we're going to restart it next Sunday. If you have done this before, we'd still like you to show up for the training. If you haven't done this but are interested, we'd like you to show up for the training. That will be Wednesday night at 6.30, immediately following the evening prayer service or Thursday morning at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary, running through what that looks like in a time post-pandemic. There is an announcement for all musicians, artists, poets, and writers about a project uh, that's happening within the community about September 11th, so we invite you to look at that. And also, anybody here like ice cream? Raise your hand, okay. Jesus never said, I'm the ice cream of life. But we're having an ice cream social next Sunday after church. And we think it'll be downstairs and Fellowship Hall might be outside. It'll, it depends on how things are going. But we invite you to come and stay after church for ice cream social, time to gather together. Are there other announcements for the congregation today? So will you please stand and body, rise and body your spirit for the blessing.
sisters and brothers, you have been fed here at Christ's table. So go out and find someone who's hungry in body, mind, or spirit, and share what you have. Go now with the love of God, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our final hymn, number 475. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. You are the body of Christ.
Thank you very much, James. And, and that's the, um, yeah, it's so nice for us. Like, as you can see, we don't have a lot of um, young people. And, um, um, I so enjoy hearing all that from the CMC. Thank you. 